Hello, Business 630 students. This is Professor Hassey speaking to you on Wednesday, June 21st, and our introduction in our lecture video for week three, concluding capital fundraising, more specifically stocks. Excuse the typo here. It's June 19th through the 25th. I don't know what 256 is doing there. Professor Hassey is not on the ball. But June 19th through June 25th with a first of our three case study lectures this week. Case number one, risk analysis of the company you selected. And I'll be going over those in just a minute. Uh, one of the key things as we head into the week three, as we begin to pick up our pace with case studies is if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Remember we have student hours every Thursday evening, six to 8 p.m. You, you can use the discussion form as our question if you have specific questions, or you can email me. But please let me know if you have any questions or concerns or you need an extension for case number one. Remember, extensions are available. Just let me know in advance, and you can take a couple extra days to complete your work. Here is where we stand currently in our class. We've now completed uh, our first discussion, which was 10% of your grade. We've completed the professor meeting, which is another 5%. And this week we're doing case number one, the credit analysis of your selected company, which is 20% of your course grade in APA format. So at the end of this week three, we will have 40% of your grade calculated already. So something to note, and everybody's off to a very good start with the discussion post and the professor meeting. So we're off all in good shape heading into week three. Speaking of being in good shape, as I post the grades to Blackboard, you'll see your grade status in the report card section. You can just click on that grade and it goes immediately to your grade center where you can see, <clears throat> where you can see the details of your course grade. As you complete case study number one this next weekend, or this weekend, I will post the return file uh, with a rubric completed uh, to show you how I graded your case. And I'll show you that sample rubric in just a second. Again, uh, your case study is posted. There's four files in the folder. The top two are the actual case in a PDF and Word format. This third file is a rubric explaining to you how I'll be grading your work. And then finally, a sample case paper of this case number one. Now, I would not use the uh, uh, um, information and data in that sample case, but it gives you an idea of the format in the APA format that I'll be looking for to assess your interpretation of the risk interpretation of your company. So a sample paper, the paper there to see a format of how we'll do this paper. Here is that case study due on Sunday the 25th. Uh, it's a, a risk analysis interpretation, both qualitative and quantitative, of the company you selected in your uh, first week of our, of our course. Remember, this is an advanced corporate finance MBA class. One of the keys, key areas of MBA study and MBA uh, uh, assessment is your interpretation and your ability to go in and do research about certain topics. And that's what's being asked in this case here. Your interpretation of the risk assessment of the company, both qualitative and quantitative. And let me give you an example of that. The first part of the case, you're asked to do a risk analysis, a risk evaluation which worth roughly a third of the grade. You are to find the credit rating of your company. You are to find what you've already done, the beta of the company. And then I'm asking you to determine with the capital asset pricing model, the required return on equity investment of this company. You have the beta. The current risk-free rate to use in your calculation is 3.75%, and the market risk return is currently 8.75% to use in your calculation. So with that data and the beta that you found for your company, what is the current required return on equity investment for your firm? With that information, I would like you to calculate the 
weighted average cost of capital for your firm. But first you need the capital structure. What percent of debt and equity is the most recent financial quarter balance sheet? That would probably be March 31st. So you are, you are to find the March 31st balance sheet of your company and what percent of the company's assets is financed by debt? What percent is equity? The two should total naturally 100%. Those are your capital structure percentages to, you be, to be used in your assessment of the weighted average cost of capital. In the capital asset pricing part of this problem, you've already calculated the return or the cost of equity. I'm giving you the current cost of debt to use as 8% and the corporate tax rate to use for this is 25%. So with that information about debt, with that information about equity, with that information about your capital structure percentages of the most recent financial quarter, I'm asking you to determine for me the weighted average cost of capital. That is a quantitative analysis of the risk of the company. In other words, a calculation of credit rating, beta, required return, average cap cost of capital. That is a quantitative analysis of your company. Then I'm asking you to do a qual qualitative re analysis of the risk of your company in two regards, organizational health and environmental health. What is the risk associated with the organization? Are they having a change in management? Do they have weak leadership? Are they having some liability issues with lawsuits or anything? What's the organizational health of the company? Also, what is the environmental risk or perspective of the company? Are they in a bad market? Do they have a lot of competition? Are there political, social risks? Does the high inflation these days affect your company more? So there, this is a qualitative analysis of organizational and environmental risk with your company. This is 65% of the assessment. Key takeaways, risk analysis seeks to identify, measure and mitigate various risk of so exposures or hazards facing a business. You've done in the first part, the measurement of risk, and now you're identifying various risk expo exposures. Quantitative risk analysis uses mathematical models and simulations to assign num numerical values. That's what you did in part one. Now you're doing a qualitative risk. Relies on your subjective judgment to build a theoretical model of risk for a given scenario. What is the organizational risk? What is the environmental risk? Risk analysis is the process of assessing the likelihood of an adverse event occurring within the corporate, government, or environmental sector. Risk analysis is the study of underlying uncertainty of a given course of action, refers to the uncertainty of forecasted cash flows, the variance of portfolio stock returns, the probability of a project's success or failure, and the possible future economic states. You are to do this analysis in an APA formatted paper with a title page, an abstract page, and references, and double space, as you can see in the sample paper I've given you in the font New Roman 12 point. The minimum is five pages, the maximum is 10. Remember, 10 pages, but you have a title page, an abstract page and references. So there's three pages there. So as you can see, you have plenty of space to do your analysis. Graphs are advisable. Charts are advisable. This is an MBA research paper and I expect the quality to be as such. Your job is to go in and research the company, go to their financials. You can use the DNB Hoover's database. You can use Yahoo. You can use the, the investors section of the company's website. It's your job to find the data. Do not ask Professor Hassey about where to get data. As a graduate student, you should be able to figure this out. I will ask, you can ask questions about what the questions mean or what I'm looking for, that is fine, but I'm not going to help you do any research. At this level of education, you should be able to figure that out. So good luck.
Have a great paper. This is a good way to start our class, interpreting a specific company's risk in the market. Here's the rubric that I'll be using to grade your work on. The percentages of your paper focus and organization, your risk evaluation of the quantitative numbers, the risk perspectives of your qualitative numbers, the abstract that you, the, your original abstract and what you're off set out to do in your paper, and are you supporting that in your writing, and also the presentation of your work in APA format. 20% for each one of those, that's how I'll be assessing your work. And you'll be getting this sheet back into your grade center with my interpretation based on what, how you did in these five areas. And then we have the sample paper that I provided. It's a basic format of a, of a case or risk analysis. As you can see, title page with all the appropriate information. The abstract page where you set your what you ought to do and what you plan on finding out in this analysis and are you going to go about doing that? The risk evaluation, information, risk perspectives, organizational health, environmental, and so on to the concluding references. That's the way I like to look at, and that's what I'd be looking for in your interpretation of this data. So this sample paper may help you. So we're gonna talk about stocks this week. So we talked about bonds last week and we're now have completed our first three weeks of interpretation of risk, of financing, of debt financing, equity financing, leading up into our capital budgeting section beginning in week four. So let's take a look at stocks. talk a little bit about what it means to own shares or stock in a company. So shares or stock. And I think we all have a general sense, but what I want to do in this video is make it a little bit more tangible to really understand exactly what you're buying when you buy a share of stock. So the general sense, and this is exactly what it really is, is when you buy stock or you buy shares, you're, you're essentially becoming a partial or a part owner of the company. Part owner of company. And just to contrast this with bonds, because they're often kind of used in the same phrasing, oh, I'm going to go buy some stocks or bonds, or I deal with stocks and bonds. Bonds, bonds, you become part lender to the company. Part lender to the company. So for example, if, if you buy a, well, I'll just say a face value bond of let's say it's $10, let's say it's $1,000, and there's 1,000 people who do that, each of you all are lending $1,000 to the company. And since there's 1,000 of you, you're lending a million dollars to the company. And I'm not going to go into detail on that, because the focus of this is going to be stock. But it's good to keep in mind that they're very different things. Here you're owning the company. Here you're lending the company. So just to get make this a little bit more tangible of exactly what we're owning, let me draw a simple balance sheet for some company X. So this is company, let me do a new color. Let's say we're dealing with company, company X right here. And let's say if we looked at company X's assets. And when we talk about assets, it really is the same thing that we mean in the real world or in our everyday life when we talk about assets. They're things that have value, things that are going to give us some type of future benefit. A house is an asset, because it gives us the future benefit of being able to live in it and protecting us from cold weather and rain. Cars are assets, because they give, provide us some transportation. Cash is an asset, because it can be exchanged for things we need in the future. So all of these. A a loan to someone else is an asset, because in the future they will pay us back. A loan to me is a liability, which we'll talk about in a second. But anyway, let me, let's me let just, in the very abstract sense, say this is company X's assets. And let's say that they're worth $100 million. $100 
million dollars. And I'm not going to go into exactly how this number is determined, or who's determining it, or who's saying this is 100 million. But let's just say this is, we agree that this is how much their land, and their patents, and their copyrights, and their cash, and, and, and their buildings, and everything else they have is worth. All of the things that will generate future value. Now, let's say that Company X has also borrowed some money. And maybe they borrowed it by issuing bonds, which I will not go into detail on. So let's say they borrowed some money. And so they owe some people, collectively, $80 million. $80 million. This could have been with a straight uh, debt from a bank, or this could have been via a bond issue. They might have issued, uh, maybe they issued a million bonds, where each of those are essentially represent a debt of $80. I won't go into that too much, but I think you get the idea what I mean, part lender. But this is debt, $80 million of debt right here. And let's say that's all of their liabilities. There are other liabilities other than debt. But for simplicity, let's say that's their only liability. And that debt tends to be the biggest. Now, what's left for the owners? And a good way to think about that is, what would happen if, if this company were sold and the debt paid off? So if the company were sold and these assets really are able to be sold for $100 million, you'd get $100 million. You'd have to pay the debt holders. You'd have to pay off the debt first. So you'd have 100 minus 80. You'd have $20 million left for the owners. I'll do that in this other green color. So you'd have $20 million left. $20 million left. And this is called the equity, or the owner's equity. Owners owner's equity. And this is completely the same idea as when people talk about having equity in a house. If I have a $300,000 house, and I still have $200,000 left on the mortgage, then I have $100,000 in equity. So it's completely analogous. And so you can see very simply that assets, and I'll write this down. You're getting a little bit of an introduction to accounting right here. But assets are going to always be equal to liabilities plus equity, because essentially, or you can view it this way, if you subtract liabilities from both sides, assets minus liabilities is equal to equity. This might be a little bit more intuitive. What we have left over is always what we own minus what we owe. That is what the owners have. Now, when we say that I'm part owner of a company, that means that I'm, I have a piece of this pie right here. This is what I am a part owner of, the equity. So for example, if we have. If there are 2 million shares, so company X, let's say they have 2 million, 2 million shares. So, and let's say that the equity is really worth $20 million. How much is each share worth if we believe all of these numbers? Well, we have $20 million of equity, 20 million of equity, of equity, divided by 2 million shares divided by 2 million shares, which gets us $10, $10 of equity of equity per share. So if we believe all of these numbers, then and we and we know that company X has 2 million shares, then we would say that each share is worth $10. And if we like these numbers, and if someone is willing to sell us a share for less than that, we would buy it. If someone was uh, willing to pay more than that, maybe we would sell it. And just to make all of this a little bit more tangible. Let's look at an actual example of a company to show you that I'm not making all of this stuff up. I got this off of your traditional financial sources. This is actually from the filings of this unnamed company. And you'll get extra bonus points if you figure out what this company is. And this is their, their actual stock trading activity. And I just want to draw the same diagram that I drew up here, the same diagram that I drew up here, to really on this company so you can kind of see that this is actually happens in the real world. So first, let's draw their assets. Let's draw this. Let's say this is Company X, and let's say this, these are its assets right there. Its assets. Let's go to its balance sheet. This is actually what they reported. This is June 30th. So, uh, well, I, I, we, we want to take the more recent date. This is, you know, they're just trying to compare to what they had before. And let's look at these. This is some time ago, but it doesn't matter. We're learning. This is we're not trying to decide whether we want to invest in this right now. This is a very old financial statement, but let's just look at what they're saying. So they have our total assets here, 30 million. I'll just do it in round numbers, 30 million dollars right there. So 30 
million. You might be curious about, hey, what's all this current asset business? Those are things that are either cash or that can be turned into cash within the next year. So for example, accounts receivable. That's money that other maybe vendors owe them that they're going to pay very soon. Inventories. These are things that they have maybe in the warehouse that they can sell and turn into cash very quickly. Other current assets. Maybe that stock or some other type of investment that they could sell and turn into cash. So they have 18 million of current and current assets. That's things that they can turn into cash very easily and very quickly, definitely within the next year. And then you have some property, plant, and equipment. This is kind of that land and buildings and, and, and machinery that I talked about. And then who knows what these other assets are. Maybe those are trademarks or patents or, or who knows what they are. But all in all, they have $30 million of assets. Now let's go to the liabilities. So they have some, they have some current liabilities, $16 million. Current liabilities, just so you know, those are liabilities. These are things that they have to pay in cash within the next year. It could be debt. It could be payables. They have to pay some other vendors. Who knows what it is? But you can kind of view it as debt on some level, maybe debt that you have to pay in the next year. And then they have a long-term debt of $5.5 million. If you add these two up, you get pretty close to about 20, 22 million. So just for simplicity, I'll put it over here as 22 million. So this company has 22 million in liabilities, 22 million liabilities. These are their assets, just to get all the labeling right. So what's left for equity? Well, just draw on this simple diagram, we have 8 million left for equity. 8 million left for equity. And actually, they did the calculation here for us. The exact number is 8.39 or 8.4 million in equity, but this is a nice round number for us to show it. So this is real world stuff that we're dealing with. And if you wanted to know kind of if you believe these numbers, if you believe that this company's assets really are worth $30 million, what should you pay for it? Well, then you're going to divide by the total number of shares. And you'll see this in some financial statements. And I won't go into the details of the difference between basic and diluted, but the numbers are very, very close. So we don't have to do uh, worry about it too much. But let's just say that this company has 2.7 looks like 2.78 million shares. So if the book value is 8.396, I mean I wrote 8 here. How much should each of these shares? Uh, how much should each of these? And when I say book value, I mean this is the, these are their books. According to their books, the equity is worth 8.4 million. So if we if we really believe that the equity is worth 8.4 million, how much should each share worth be worth? Well, we'll just divide. 8.4 million, we'll just have to divide 8.4 million, 8.4 million, this is actually an 8.4, I wrote 8 there for simplicity, divided by the number of shares, 2.78 million. So that's a million, and that's a million. And I'll get a calculator out for this one right here. So let's see, we are doing 8.4 million divided by 2.78 million shares. So according, if we believe these numbers, if we believe the books, the book value of the shares is about three, $3.02 per share. So this is $3.02 per share, book value per share. That's what we should be willing to pay for this, or what we think a fair price per share of this company is, if we think these assets are really worth $30 million. Now, what are people actually paying for these shares? Well, that's we got we look at these this this information right here, and we see that the last trade here was for two dollars and fifty eight. So people are paying a discount to the number we just calculated. So the only reason why people are paying less than that, or someone's willing to sell for less than three dollars, is that someone out there, especially the person selling, thinks that this company really the assets of this company really aren't worth thirty million. He or she thinks that the assets of this company are worth less than thirty million, and maybe they think that the company's prospects aren't as good. Their their Product isn't good. the the sales are going to go down. Who knows? Maybe the person buying it, maybe they think it is worth three dollars a share, and that's why they're willing to pay two dollars fifty eight for it because they think it's going to go up. And just so that we get you know some of the other uh, details that we see here, this bid, this bid right here, this is what uh, someone has explicitly said that they're wi willing to pay for a share. The ask is what someone has explicitly said they're willing to sell a share for. 
This 52-week range is the range of prices that the shares have sold. So, so, so in the past year, these shares sold for at least as low as a dollar twenty, and that was actually a great deal because then they went up. Uh, well, you know, even now, or they're selling at two dollars fifty-eight. The average volume right here. This is this is the number of shares sold per day, exchanged per day. The market cap. Right here, you've probably heard that word before. That's essentially the market's sense of what this number really is. We're saying that the books of this company are saying this company is worth $8 million. But the market cap is saying what the equity of the company is worth in the market's mind. And to get that number, they're taking the $2.58. They're taking the $2.58 times the number of shares, times the 2.78 million shares. If we do that, we're going to get let's see, 2.58 times 2.78 is equal to exactly, well, it's a little different than what they had. Maybe it's a little round off ever, but roughly 7 million in market cap. So like I said before, the market is not paying $3. It's paying $2.58. And so the market is saying that the equity, this piece right here, is closer to $7 million, even though the books are saying that this number right here is above $8 million. Well, anyway, hopefully that was a little bit uh, useful and, and gives you a little bit of a sense of, of what, actually, what it actually means to buy shares in a company. Well, that's a very good video for a basic understanding of what stock is. And what we're studying these last couple of weeks leads into the strategic thinking and the in critical thinking of our course. In other words, we can't make any strategic decisions about where we're going to invest in or how to run the company until we understand the basics of how the company is capitalized, how they're financed, debt, equity. And equity is stock. And that's why we're spending a little bit of time these first couple of weeks is understanding what these are in relationship to the risk in the market, what they are in relationship to how we go, how a company goes about and raises capital. Then once we get these basics down, we get into discussions, strategic discussions and analysis about what we do with our capabilities of raising capital and how we do use that to increase our business buy assets. So one of the key features of stock is that <clears throat> stock is a is an interesting thing because it's ownership whereas bonds and bank lending is credit. In other words, you have to pay that money back. When you own stock though, you are an owner. So many times during the course of a period of time like this video just said, you want to understand what the value of that stock is, not only book value on your financial statements, but also what is its value given in the market. And the market will determine its value is how the market thinks and looks at how your company is being operated. So there's two types of stock. There's common stock, which is basic stock that pays dividends. And that's the stock that's in your portfolios that you're doing in this, that you've maybe done in other classes or maybe uh, the, what you own in your retirement funds. And then there's also preferred stock. Preferred stock is stock that has a guaranteed dividend. All common stock, the dividend is declared by the company at different times during the course of a year. But sometimes they go without paying a dividend due to the financial conditions of the company. But a preferred stock is issued solely, solely to the person who buys that stock. They know they're getting a specific dividend every three or six months of that stock. So it's a little bit more attractive to investors because you know exactly what your dividend payout will be. But also many companies shy away from preferred stock because it's almost like a debt instrument. You have to pay the dividend. If you don't pay the dividend, you go in default and have to sell off assets in order to meet that obligation. So a lot of companies shy away from preferred stock because it's too much of a, of a debt service. It's, it's like you have to do it. So common stock is the prevalent what we're going to talk about today in our spreadsheets is what, how do you determine the value of a stock in the market? There's the dividend growth model, the free cash flow valuation model, a variety of different ways of understanding the value of stock in the market. This looks a little complicated, but it's fairly, fairly straightforward. How, when you own stock, how does that apply to the valuation of the company? In other words, if you own stock, why do you own stock? Because you're an owner of the business and you want to participate in the growth and the value of the increased value of the company as they provide returns. What is a return? Return is free cash flow. 
It's the amount of cash that they have generated over and beyond just operating their business, the cash that they're generating to add value to the business. It's just like, you can relate to this in your own personal life. When you first started in a new job, and let's say you're just at the beginning of entrance into your company, you get paid $50,000 a year. Well, that $50,000 is, is a nice salary for you, but at the same time, it only basically, especially if you live in Southern California, that $50,000 is only going to go so far and you're just only going to be able to afford the basic living needs that you do, rent, food, clothing, transportation. The $50,000 is not going to give you much extra income. Well, let's say you get a pay raise to $100,000 and your lifestyle stays the same. So now at $50,000, you were able to meet your obligations of running your life. But now that you're making $50,000, you're going to have additional cash that you can invest, that you can do something else with. And in the terms of corporations, that's a definition of free cash flow. It's additional money that you have to pay out dividends, to pay back debt, to grow the company. So free cash flow is a very good way of looking at the value of a company because you take that free cash flow and you divide it by your cost of capital. And you determine that over a period of time. But what you're trying to do is you take how much money you're generating and dividing it by the cost of your money. Remember, the cost of capital is the combination of the firm's debt and equity, capital structure. Remember, you're doing the capital structure in your case work this week. The capital structure is the amount of debt, liabilities, and equity, or the right-hand side of the company's balance sheet. That has to total 100%, and you're trying to find that out for your specific companies. Once you find that capital structure mix, then you determine the cost of debt and the cost of equity, and you can determine the cost of capital. Taking that cost of capital and dividing it by the free cash flow, you can determine the corporate valuation or what is called the intrinsic value of a company. These are all basics of understanding corporate finance, the cost of money, free cash flow. So remember the capital asset pricing model that we talked about last week is how to determine the cost of equity. The cost of debt is basically your after-tax after -tax cost of debt. We talked about that last week as well. So what you're doing in part of the analysis of the risk of your company is you're trying to determine A, what's the capital structure of your business? What portion of debt and equity funds the assets of the company off your balance sheet or book values? Then you're determining the cost of debt, which is given to you in the problem. Then you're determining the cost of equity, which is given to you to calculate in the problem. You combine these with the capital structure. You can determine the company's cost of capital. Remember, the lower the cost of capital, the greater the value of your company. And I'll show that to you in our spreadsheet in a little bit. So this is why we're studying stocks and bonds and determining how this all relates to because you trying to find cheap money to invest in your business. And the cheaper the money, also based on the capital structure of your company, entitles you to value. And as financial manager and to make strategic decisions, you have to find that balance of capital structure and cost to determine the true value of your company and make it attractive for investors in the market, which will drive your investment in assets to create new markets for your business. As I said earlier, stockholders or stock, it can indicates or represents ownership in your business. And it means if you're a stockholder and you get all the stockholders together, they control the business. And how do they control the business? Stockholders elect board of directors. The board of directors are picked and voted on by the stockholders and they run the company. They hire the management. They hire the managers. They run the business and make the important decisions. So the stockholders run the company. Now, the day-to-day -day operations are done by the managers that are hired by the board of directors. And it's the, it's the job of the managers of the company to maximize the stock price and the valuation of the company. If they do that, they get to keep their job because the stockholders are gonna be happy that they're maximizing their value. Who has the claims on this corporate value? In other words, 
if you uh, if you wanted to if you're if you're in bankruptcy or if you want to sell the company, who gets paid first on that right hand side of the balance sheet? Well, if you've lent the company m money, you get paid first. All right, bondholders, banks, even vendors, anybody who you owe money to, they get settled first when you're trying to either sell the business or go in bankruptcy. If you have any preferred stock, they get paid next as with the with the ending of your business. And finally, the stockholders, the common stockholders, they get whatever's left over of the business should the company close. So that's why it's in your interest as a stockholder to pick companies that are ongoing, that don't have any chance of closing or selling, or maybe even being taken over or merged. You want to remain a stockholder and keep value in your company. You want that company to keep operating. Now, I want to show you how a company is valued based on their free cash flow. And again, you do not have to worry about doing this calculation. I'm never going to ask you to do this calculation, but I wanted to show you in the real world how this is calculated. So let's say a company now, this right now, is generating $24 million a year <laughs> Excuse me, in free cash flow. In other words, cash available for investment. Their cost of capital is 11%. So if you take their cost of debt and their cost of equity, compare or relay it to the capital structure of the business, their WAC is 11%. And let's say this company expects the free cash flow, and now it's which is now 24 million, to grow at a constant rate of 5% a year. In other words, they anticipate the business to grow 5% a year. And let's say on the, on the assets, the company has $100 million in short-term investments, has $200 million in debt or liabilities, has $50 million in preferred stock. Remember, preferred stock is dividend-only stock. And then they have 10 million shares of that stock. So if I wanted to determine the value of this company's operations, what is this company worth today? What I would do is I would take the free cash flow of $24 million and I would increase it at 5%, which is the next year's constant growth rate. And I would divide that by, let's go back. I would divide that by the weighted average cost of capital and my constant growth rate. So if I do that calculation, take the $24 million free cash flow, increase it by 5%, and divide it by the difference between the cost of capital and my growth rate, which is 6%, I end up with a valuation of $420 million of this company. That's how much, that's the relationship of the return of investment by what it cost us to get that investment. So we're making 400, the value of the company is $420 million. If I take that $420 million and I add in the short-term investment, remember the value of operations is what the, the asset base or the long-term assets base are generating in return. If I add to that my short-term investments, I have a total value of the company of $520 million. $420 million being generated by the $24 million free cash flow divided by the weighted average cost of capital minus the growth rate. And then the additional short-term investment and other investments that the company has outside of the company to I get a value of four, $520 million. From that, I subtract out how much I owe, 20 million, and I subtract out the, the value of the preferred stock, which is 50 million. I now end up with a common stock equity position of $270 million. Notice this is a little bit more complicated than the video we saw, we saw where the gentleman kept that pretty simple. But this is how you would determine the, the intrinsic value, the true value of a company by taking into account and determining the value of operations, adding in any additional assets that are outside of the company, subtracting out the debt, subtracting out preferred stock, which is considered debt anyways, and you're left with a $270 million common stock base. If I take that $270 million and divide it by the current stock 
price or n and let me let me go back and show you that what that n is remember n is the number of shares of stock that's 10 million shares of stock so they have 10 million shares of stock have a value of 270 million that means the stock price really now in intrinsic value is 27 dollars a share so this company this stock is worth 27 dollars a share Financial managers, CFOs track this on a quarterly basis because they want to compare what they think the intrinsic value of the stock is to what the market views their value of their stock. Okay. And so that's how we calculate the value of stock intrinsically. Now here's a spreadsheet in our lecture notes that kind of give more examples of that, especially about the subject that we just talked about. We've determined, let's say a company generates $400,000 of free cash flow. It's anticipated to grow at a 6% rate and its current cost of capital is 5.99%. So they anticipate that the free cash flow in the coming year is 420,000, that's their projections. So if I take that 420,000 and divide it by the net of my difference between constant growth and weighted average cost of capital, which is 5.99%, my company is actually worth a little bit over $7 million. From that, you subtract out any debt and then you take that remaining balance and divide it by the number of shares of stock outstanding and you get your intrinsic value stock price. Many chief financial managers' decisions of whether they should go out and raise new capital, they use this value of operations calculation to show investors that this company is worth more, is doing better from year to year. They track it, and this, this applies to many companies. One of the things that talked about stock earlier is, remember, the cost of equity. You're doing this in your Case number one, where I give you the beta of the, you're going to find the beta of your specific company. You're going to be given the risk-free rate or the 10-year United States Treasury yield. That's given in the problem. You're given your market premium rate, which has a beta of one. And you're going to be combining those into the capital asset pricing model to determine that their, your required rate of return is 8.67%. That's what your investors of equity expect to return from your business based on the risk of your specific company in relationship to zero risk in the market and average risk in the market. It's called your rate of return. And this is the capital asset pricing model. I'm asking you to do that with those values that I give you as given for your business in case number one. Here's another example of way of looking at intrinsic value. It's called the constant growth rate model. Remember here, we're using free cash flow. Here in this one, we're using dividends. Let's say a company in the next year is going to pay $1.50 in dividends. They expect those dividends to grow in the future at 6%. Right now, their required expected return based on our calculation here is 8.67%. If I take the $1.50 and divide it by 8.67% minus the expected growth rate, I get the stock price to be currently about $56.18 a share. That's the intrinsic value based on the projections of growth and cost of capital for this company. Let's say the stock is traded right now at $60 a share, but its intrinsic value is $56.18. If I was a shareholder in this company, I would sell the stock immediately. Take the 60 bucks. Because if you hang on to this stock a little bit longer, eventually the market is going to figure out what this true intrinsic value is, and it's, the stock price is going to fall. So now's the time to sell the stock. I wouldn't buy the stock now, because if you go to the market and buy this stock, you're going to pay $60 for the stock when the value is $56.18. And this is some of the common rules of investment management for a lot of brokerage firms. They determine the intrinsic value, and then they take a look at that stock in relationship to what the market sees its value, and they recommend a buy or a sell or a hold based on that analysis. All this plays into the decision-making. 
But what's part of the decision making? This cost of capital calculation that we're doing here. So two ways of looking at companies values. For stock using the constant growth model here, and for the overall value of the operations using the free cash flow model, as we explained here. Two important tools, and we'll use these tools as we go forward in our class. So we're off and running with week number three. There's a great basis of stock and its valuation. Some good information to use and which you will use as we go out for the remaining weeks of our course. Have a great week, everybody. And look for my update video of the weekend. If you have any questions, remember we have student hours on Thursday night. Until then, adios.